When the king was settled in his palace and the Lord had granted him safety from all the enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, Here I am, dwelling in a house of cedar, while the ark of the Lord abides in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go and do whatever you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and say to my servant David, Thus said the Lord, Are you the one to build a house for me to dwell in? From the day that I brought the people of Israel out of Egypt to this day, I have not dwelt in a house, but have moved about in tent and tabernacle. As I moved about wherever the Israelites went, did I ever reproach any of the tribal leaders whom I appointed to care for my people Israel? Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Further, say thus to my servant David, Thus said the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the flock, to be ruler of my people Israel, and I have been with you wherever you went. I have cut down your enemies before you. Moreover, I will give you great renown like that of the greatest men on earth. I will establish a home for my people Israel and will plant them firm so that they shall dwell secure and shall tremble no more. Evil men shall not oppress them any more as in the past. Ever since I appointed chieftains over my people Israel, I will give you safety from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that he, the Lord, will establish a house for you. When your days are done and you lie with your fathers, I will rise, I will raise up your offspring after you, one of your own issue, and I will establish his kingship. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish his royal throne forever. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord lives forever. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So what is it that makes a house a home? You know, it seems simple enough. We all know that, that it just being a house by itself doesn't make it a home. A house is just a house, building, bricks and mortar, siding, roofing, plumbing, electricity, cable, internet. Well, yeah, I guess it, it depends uh, what qualifies as a house to you. It, it, a house uh, is, is a little something different to us in different parts of the world, uh, depending on who we are, what we have, and so forth. Uh, but much like uh, where we are right now, what makes this beautiful building where we are right now a church? Crosses, banners, pulpit, a table, candles. Does any of that make it a church? I don't think so. You know, it's a building built for the specific purpose of being a church, sure. We call it a church, but still it's just a building. Today as we look at this passage from 2 Samuel, you may recognize this because we actually looked at this passage pretty recently, from a few months ago, as uh, something we've looked uh, at recently. We've already talked about some of the matters of this passage. Uh, David sitting on his new throne in Jerusalem, and he's in the city of David. Now I wanted to mention this about the city of David because this is pretty cool, and we just might picture Jerusalem today kind of like in an older state inside the walls there, uh, but the city of David was the original original version, David's version of Jerusalem. And, in, and today it's actually outside of the city walls of Jerusalem. And they're excavating it. They, when they found it, they discovered it's outside the walls. Those walls were built later and didn't include this original city of David, this original David's Jerusalem. And that got buried in time and soil over the ages. As, you know, throughout the history of Jerusalem being built up and destroyed and rebuilt and burnt down and rebuilt and time and time again. Um, and so that, when you picture the city of David, um, try not to picture so much Jerusalem or inside the walls and the pictures as we see it today, kind of that polished version. It's very polished. It's, it's beautiful. Uh, and, and it has been. It's not just today. Uh, the King Herod's version of Jerusalem with that large, huge temple is 
very polished, very beautiful. We're talking about even way before that. Um, as you see in uh, the, the picture up there, uh, a, a bunch of rocks stacked on top of each other is, is the construction of these. It wasn't these giant, beautiful, polished stones and things. It was a whole different kind of construction a long time uh, before the stuff that we're seeing come after it. Uh, and as we talked about before, David's getting settled in this new home, in this, this city of David, this original Jerusalem. No longer is he in Hebron, and where he's served his first seven and a half years as, as king, now in Jerusalem. A new stack of rocks, new decorations. He's in a new house built with cedar. And that, unfortunately, that cedar didn't survive for us today. We have no idea what this house of cedar might have looked like. All we've got today is just rocks and other remnants of old, like pottery and arrowheads and more. Uh, however lavish this house of cedar was, uh, we can't really tell, but it must have been pretty lavish compared to everything else. And it was putting the current house of God to shame. Now, God, uh, of course, resided in this Ark of the Covenant, or at least that it symbolized God's presence, and they, they believed of that being housing God's presence, kind of a mobile home for God. And the Ark of the Covenant was in a tent. Well, David was in a house of cedar. The Ark of the Covenant was in a tent. And this was unacceptable. Here David sits in this new throne, lavish house of cedar, and the Ark of the Covenant, God's presence, is sitting in a tent. David felt that this current house for God was absolutely unacceptable, especially considering what David was in. Now David was uh, kind of on the right path with this, but he had some serious misunderstanding and he had to be corrected. Now, as we talked about this last time, David wanted to build this new house for the Ark of, uh, of the Covenant to reside in. Nathan agreed with them, and then Nathan got this, uh, the, this uh, vision or, or this uh, voice from the Lord speaking to him that night to go uh, deliver a message to David and also to correct Nathan's thinking. Both David and Nathan were thinking that a better house needed to be built, constructed, a structure, a better structure needed to be made for God. God spoke to Nathan to clear things up, and... Uh, God mentioned that God has no desire for a bigger and better built building. A tent was just fine. God had been in tent all these years. You know, that was the, the normal house, and, and God never complained about it. God wasn't asking for a better structure to be in. God's presence makes anything holy and better than anything on earth than we can make by the, the work of our hands and the sweat of our brows. All of creation is something God built. Though, I mean, what's a building, really? I mean, maybe if we build a universe, we might really have something. Uh, we're just working with stuff that God's already made. So God spells this out for Nathan to say to David and, uh, and explains it um, that God doesn't need a new structure. And God says, I took you from the pasture, from following the flock to rule my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you went. I've cut enemies down for you. Moreover, I will give you great renown. I will establish for you a home for my people Israel I will plant them firm they shall dwell secure shall tremble no more I will establish a house for you in other words God is saying don't bother putting up a better building for me I've got more important things in mind for you as we talked about last time we can build buildings all day long for God but none of them will ever really be a home for God because we've been taught the true home for God. It's mentioned as early in Leviticus and then it, Jesus and Christian since have taught us this, that our bodies are holy temples. We are the holy temple for God to live in. So our first priority is to make sure the temple is clean and, and right and a proper place for God's spirit to dwell, right? We clean up ourselves, we wipe off the grime we collect up over the years, we purify ourselves from evil, we turn ourselves from being empty structures that are built for the purpose of housing God's spirit into structures that are actually housing and being a proper home for God's spirit. So what is it that makes a house a home? If we take our cue from God, it's obviously a whole lot more than bricks and mortars, stones and cedar no matter how beautifully it's put together. And, you know, Meg and I have talked a lot about this in, in recent times. As we've been doing our long-distance thing, you know, it's painfully obvious that when we are apart, neither where I am nor where she is at feels like home. 
when we're together, whichever place we go together feels like home. Not because of a building, not because of the great memories in that building, not because of a location, but because we're together and because what there is between us. Going off of what God is saying in this passage, we can take some clues uh, about how God feels about us and all that God has done for us, all that God has shown us throughout the years. And then also going off of what we experience in real life, whatever it is exactly that makes a house a home is something a whole lot more special than bricks and mortar. It's even more special than people being in the same location. Now it's like we talk about here at church. We talk a lot about how the church is not the building, even though we call the building a church. What makes it a church is the people and what exists among the people. Early Christians didn't have church buildings, but they were the church. Being the church originally had nothing to do with what building they were in. They just met in each other's homes. It's about being people gathered around believing in Jesus Christ as our Messiah and then what that means for us as people living in the world. We know from, uh, from Jesus and Paul and Peter and the gang that believing in Jesus means to do what he says. And Jesus taught us an awful lot about how to be, about what to show. Love, forgiveness, compassion, mercy grace, making peace, leaving our sins behind, giving ourselves to a new way of being. Now without all that, Christians gathered together in the same place doesn't mean a whole lot. It's not much more than bricks and mortars. It's a little more than an empty building, but it still doesn't mean a whole lot. And even worse, it could make a mockery of our Lord, depending on how we behave. Now, I, I, thinking about our own homes again, if Megan and I were not giving ourselves in love to each other and all everything that comes with love, what that means as far as how we are towards each other, if we weren't doing that, then even being together in whatever place we were in wouldn't make it feel like a home. It'd be a little more than an empty building, sure, but still not a home. And just like that, if we as the church are not giving ourselves and God's love to each other, this place will likewise not feel like our church home. A little more than an empty building, sure, but not a church. So then, well, how long am I going to beat this dead horse today, right? What makes a house a home? It's love, right? Everybody say it with me. What makes a house a home? Love. Amen. Yes, that's right. What? Uh, that's what makes a house a home, and that's what makes a church building a church, is all this love, genuine love, and everything that that means for us as people living today in the world. Love is where forgiveness comes from. Love is where compassion comes from. Love is where mercy comes from. Love is where healing comes from. Love is where we find true peace. Love drives us to leave our sins behind. Love drives us to become something new. For ourselves and for all of creation. Love leads us to purify ourselves, to wipe off the grime, to become a proper place for God's Spirit to live in. As we give ourselves to love, we find ourselves in the midst of what's described today in the book of Ephesians. Hope. In times that seem hopeless. Peace emerging from the breaking down of dividing walls and hostility forming of one collective humanity, reconciliation with each other, reconciliation with God. And steeped in love, we find ourselves no longer strangers, but citizens with the saints and members of God's household, joined together as a structure built on the cornerstone of Jesus Christ, with each of us growing into being the holy temple God has made each one of us to be a proper home for God's Spirit to dwell, and coming together as a collective holy temple for God's Spirit to dwell. So congregation, let us give ourselves to love and all that comes with it, all that that means for us living in the world right now. May we continue being, or become for the first time, far more than empty buildings simply built to do something important. Far more than bricks and mortar, far more than even crosses and banners. 
Let us invite love into our own personal lives. Bring love into our homes and into our church. Let us take love out into the world. May we individually and collectively be the holy temple God made us to be and that God is calling us to create in ourselves a home for God and a blessing for all of creation.